Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I'm Michael Hanrahan, uh, the 2011 president of AIE New Jersey. Um, on behalf of AIE New Jersey and our board of trustees, uh, we are very proud of our continued relationship with NGIT's College of Architecture and Design. My predecessors in the New Jersey Society of Architects were influential and instrumental in creating this public school of architecture here in Newark back when it was uh, Newark College of Engineering. So flash forward 35 years later, and we're proud to continue that legacy by helping to sponsor NGIT's spring lecture series. Representing approximately 2,000 architects that live and work in the state of New Jersey, and as an alum, I know firsthand the quality students that graduate here year after year, highly prepared with the skills and knowledge necessary to advance the profession of architecture in New Jersey and beyond. As you know, tonight's lecture is by internationally renowned architect Daniel Liebskin. His work ranges from major cultural and commercial projects down to set and object design. And when we decide to fund these lecture series, this is exactly what we're looking for every year. Um, it's uh, Mr. Liebskin's approach uh, to design and architecture that embodies this uh, college's mission statement. And I'll just read a brief portion of it that design is intrinsically an optimistic profession. As designers, we aspire to better the conditions of human life, to elevate the spirit, stir the emotions, engage the intellect, and improve the quality of human experience through intervention in the built environment at all scales. I applaud the efforts of the NJIT College of Architecture and Design community to produce tonight's lecture. And again, AIA, excuse me, AIA New Jersey is proud to sponsor this event, and it is truly an event. For tonight, we are all fans of this profession. Mr. Liebskin's work and ideas continue to inspire us and will inf influence generations of architects to come. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Uh, th thank you, Michael, and again to AIA New Jersey, the New Jersey Society of Architects, for your continued support of our college, and specifically this lecture series. I would also like to welcome our faculty, staff, and students, and thank our university provost, Ian Gatley, for attending, as well as uh, Deputy Mayor Stefan Pryor of Newark, who I saw walk in before. Welcome, Stefan, Deputy Mayor, uh, for being here as well. Uh, as you know, Mr. Liebskin, the 2011 endowed lecturer, joins an esteemed list of guests to the university, including Tom Main, Stephen Kieran, and Bernard Schumi, and none of which would be possible without AIA's continued support of this program. Uh, Mr. Liebeskin is, is an internationally known architect and designer whose realized buildings are increasingly changing the face of cities worldwide. His practice extends from building major cultural and commercial institutions, including museums and concert halls, to convention centers, universities, housing, hotels, shopping centers, and residential work. Mr. Liebeskin has designed such world-renowned projects as the Master Plan for the World Trade Center in New York and the Jewish Museum in Berlin. More recently, the studio has completed the Grand Canal Theater Project, a major addition uh, to Dublin's Docklands and Cultural Core, as well as Crystals at City Center, a major project and retail project in Las Vegas. The studio has also several projects under construction, including the Military History Museum in Dresden, which will be discussed tonight. In addition to his built work, Mr. Liebeskin is well known for introducing new critical discourse into architecture. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the Cooper Union School of Architecture and an MA in History and Theory from the University of Essex School of Comparative Studies in Great Britain. Mr. Liebeskin is joined tonight at the round table with my esteemed colleagues, Dean Urs Gauschott and distinguished professor Michael Mostoller. Dean Gauschott. I'm, I'm very pleased that we have the, an opportunity to have a conversation this evening. Thank you. Uh, it is always interesting to me how somebody ends up in a particular profession. And I know that you were a child prodigy as a musician. You played the accordion. And uh, uh, Isaac Perlman, at one, one stage in his life, stood in your, stood in your shadow. Uh, then you decided to become an artist, and you were very proficient as an artist, and that seemed to be where you were headed. Uh, and, and then your mother apparently said to you, 
<laughs> you can always do art in architecture, but you can't do architecture in art. You've got two fish with one hook. And uh, it's interesting to me, having responded to three muses, that you not only were seduced into studying architecture, but you stuck with it. What made you <coughs> stick with it and not veer back to the other callings that got you there in the first place? That's a great question. Certainly my mother's wisdom. Uh, I, I think it is certainly true that I gravitated towards the arts because architecture involves a civic responsibility. And I didn't think that was going to be my calling. But in fact, uh, as I discovered, architecture combines so many of my interests, which are not only interest in drawing and painting and so on, but also interest in, in science, interest in mathematics, uh, kind of scientific aspects. Uh, I did go to the Bronx High School of Science, where wh I remember when I applied to Cooper Union, I was asked whether I was sure that I wanted to be an architect because they never had anybody with that background, you know, in physics. And th there was, in the, in the space times, uh, where, where, oh, yeah. where Americans were trying to catch up with, with the Russians in technology, and I was at a special program, PSSC, Presidential Science Study Committee. So I guess I, I, I discovered that architecture is a, one of the most incredible fields to be in because you can really discover so many connections with your interests, whatever those muses that you have are. And of course, uh, it continues to evolve. Architecture isn't really even defined. Uh, we often think we know what architecture is, but architecture has such a wide wonderment, uh, such a wide dimension that, that almost anyone who is interested in something, who has a passion for something, who loves something, can certainly find a place in architecture. And of course, even the word architecture is used by scientists, you know, or, 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 or people in, uh, in, in uh, uh, astrophysics or in medicine, because there's an architecture to the world, architecture to experience. So I've been lucky. I wonder if we could narrow that down a little. Uh, it, it's interesting that the, uh, the simultaneity of NJIT, and I think my first awareness of the work from your hand would be in your drawings at Max Protech. Uh, and I remember them uh, shimmering there in front of me. There's deep space, there's surface space. They're so amazingly crafted. So if, if we were to say, well, where does architecture begin? It's, it's in my memory uh, of your work, it was in those drawings. Oh, definitely. Uh, and then at, at Cranbrook, the same, it, it continued. Definitely. In other words, with chamber works and the... Uh, like Omega series, uh, yes. Right, so what did that mean to be doing that at that time for you? I mean, you had graduated from Cooper, you were on your own, and, and you were producing architecture or <laughs> science or music, well, what was it? It's a very interesting question, not easy to define, but you know, when I graduated from school, I tried to find, you know, you know I had illustrious mentors, you know, whether it was Richard Meyer or, you know, well-known architect, and I worked for a few days here and there, then I realized I wasn't enjoying the office atmosphere, and, and it kind of it wasn't for me, that, that world. Uh, and so I drifted into another world, but I always thought that the sources of architecture are in drawing. I always, you know, when I drew, I didn't think I was wasting my time, as many other people thought. You know, why am I not, you know, working as an architect? Why am I sitting, you know, at a desk and, and, and you know, at that time drawing with pencil and ink and so on, on, on very kind of a seemingly archaic uh, way to do architecture. But I always believed, as did the masters of the Renaissance, whom I admire, or the masters of the Baroque, the drawing is truly the source of architecture because it's a connection, imaginatively and also practically, on your paper. You, you, so I, I thought I was doing architecture. Of course, I knew that it wasn't the architecture of you know, making high-rise buildings or, or, or city plans. But I, I developed a, an idea of what I think architectural space can be as built space in a drawing. And I think, look, it's, it's not my idea. Michelangelo, one of the greatest artists of all time, suggested to his uh, nephew, Antonio, who was trying to find out what to do to be an architect, he says, don't get a job, just draw. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I found this in retrospect, but anyway, I, I, I just completed a drawing project uh, just a few weeks ago, when I had a, a respite from a lot of travel. I sat down, uh, you know, it's not easy to find time when you're very busy, but I thought, you know, you have to produce something which is not about just constructing a building, but something which is seemingly without any application. And yet you feel when you're drawing it that it is not really a fiction, but a true realization of potential ideas. So would you say, that over the years, 
you were trying to capture architectural space in those drawings, or you were trying to create form? I mean, what, what would you say would summarize that creative impulse, and what has happened? Has it changed? It, I mean, it hasn't changed. No, it hasn't changed because I, I don't think I was trying to create spaces or buildings. It was maybe kind of a meditation in the form of architecture. I don't know how else to put it. it it's not only the product, an aesthetic product, which can be hung in a gallery that I was interested in, but the whole process in making whatever it was, th those lines on paper, which I didn't think were just lines on paper, but referred to experience, both my own, but also an experience of others uh, in those places. So, uh, you know, I, I, can, I have to tell you that the drawings which I made many years ago, I still use. They, they were not a waste of time. Uh, I, I use them practically for, you know, when I have a master plan, when I have a building to build, when I have some details to develop. Those drawings, to me, are the way architects have developed their own, uh, uh, you know, drawings, whether it's the Corbusier or Palladio, or, you know, you have to develop something which you can uh, you use uh, in the future. In, in your drawings, I can very much see the creative process because you have drawing upon drawing upon drawing that explore themes in a, in a fairly systematic way. It isn't completely arbitrary. No. There seems to be a sequence to it. Uh, but when you talk about how, what inspires you to do a building a certain way, you talk very much about the creative moment. And there's a real difference between the creative process, which is linear in, in character, even though it can deviate from that linearity, and the creative moment, the aha moment, the eureka moment. And uh, how do you, uh, in your architecture, uh, see the creative process as opposed to the creative moment? Another great question. Uh, of course, there, there, there is a difference between those two things. The creative moment is the moment where you can realize something, when you're conscious of something that, that was not obvious. There, there's a sense of wonder associated with that creative moment. The process of realizing something is a very disciplined, rigorous uh, uh, undertaking, which requires a lot more knowledge than simply the aha moment. So I think it's how to connect, in my view, those two things, how to make the process equally interesting, equally passionate, mm -hmm. uh, as the initial idea. Because often if you have a great idea and then the process is boring, laborious, uninteresting, the idea is simply vitiated. It's destroyed. It can be undermined by the process. And I see this very often in my field or in any other field, music or literature or cinema or even science. So it's how to extend that moment of wonderment and create a building which continues to sort of be a discovery, uh, not only in the making of it, but also for those who would then use the building uh, be clients of the building, uh, the uh, public. Uh, architecture today is very much a team effort. Lots of people are involved. Uh, the client usually is not one person, but a bunch of people. Uh, uh, how do you have a creative moment when you're dealing with a collective? Because a creative moment, almost by definition, is not a collective activity. So how do you reconcile the idea of a, a collective um, um, problem statement, collective decision making, collective execution of a project, and the creative moment, which is a singular vision by a singular person. Well, this is the secret of architecture. It's not a profession of uh, committees. I don't, I, I don't believe it. It's still an art, a civic art. It has to be conceived, taken responsibility for as an artistic, uh, as an artistic endeavor, because it's, it's more than simply the functional needs that the building or city will, will, will meet. But at the same time, of course, you have to have a fantastic creative team. You have to work in a, in a collaborative manner with, with everyone in order to realize a vision. So it's not about the ego on one hand, here is I have an idea, and then let's sketch it out and let's give it and put it into a big machine that will turn it out into a success. But let's create that, that environment in which an idea can thrive and even develop during construction, uh, during the, the moment when, when you're working on working drawings. You need to maintain that, I believe, one needs to maintain that creativity down to the details you know, of, of, of the mechanical systems. Because architecture, as we all know, is not just one thing or another. It's all of those things together. How would you say that translates into the other side of the equation? I mean, it seems to me your genius is this passion and this creativity. Uh, it seems to imply that form actually has a claim on people's attention 
who are supposedly these days now on Twitter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so how, how do we get them down to the Denver Museum and off of their iPods that, that somehow or another in all of us or the whole audience or our contemporary society, this passion for form exists? Uh, well, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, get one of my favorite poets, uh, the German poet Hölderlin, and I'm going to translate from German uh, into English, he says, to live is to defend a form. You know, I read that, you know, it, he said to live. Is to, and I you know, thought, what does he mean, to live is to defend? He meant more than a visual form. He meant the form of the spirit, the form of, 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 of openness, the form of freedom, the big form, which is not uh, the, limited to just, uh, let's say, as we understand, uh, a volume. He's called it the grand form. Or the grand form, as we said. So yes, I think that's, that's uh, I, think, I think everyone has passion. I think technology. You're right. There, we, we, we are blessed with incredible new technologies. I think they're fantastic. But there has to be a balance between technology, which in its, in its process, in its, process in, its, in its way it works, can also be demonic in a way. You can use technology right. in demonic ways, in orgiastic ways. Technology is not just something neutral uh, and, and, and obvious. It, it has a metaphysical dimension. So one has to put everything in balance in, 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 a, in a life. It's not just the architect's life. Everybody has to put in balance te technical possibilities and their own uh, cultural sense of identity, uh, place. Um, uh, I want to change a little bit the direction we're going in uh, and talk to you about uh, a, a paradoxical situation. and. That is that you are very much talk in your autobiography about uh, a Jewish identity, uh, and throughout history, Jewish buildings tended to be adaptive, be in the background, not be in the foreground, not to be noticed. The whole idea was not to stand out. And, and you have become uh, identified with a vocabulary that is now looked at as representing Jewish architecture. Uh, if there is such a thing. Uh, uh, and your forms uh, are idiosyncratic, they are daring, they're dashing, they are certainly not at all adaptive and quiet. They're quite the opposite. And they stand out uh, and they, they've become icons wherever they appear. And so it's expected that if you get a commission that you will do the opposite of what was known as Jewish architecture, which is to blend into the background and, and become part of the fabric. I think that would be a good way to kind of, okay. while you well, talk, we can well, ease into the first project. I, I, so. I can only say that to me, uh, when you talk about Jewish architecture in quotes, we have to see the, the millennia going by. We have to see uh, the position of Jews. We have to see the development of antisemitism, nationalism. We have to see Jewish history in a greater uh, range. And of course, don't forget, any reader of the biblical text will know that in the biblical text, architecture is not reduced to a background. Whether, whether it's the tabernacle in the desert, whether it's the ark, whether it's the temple, there are passive, there are long, you know, you can hardly read the biblical account without wondering why is there so much time spent, not on describing how a building looks, but what a building substantially is. So I think, uh, as Bruno Zevi, uh, Italian uh, critic, said that any architecture that rebels against the world is a kind of exodus out of slavery and into a new rebellious form against the established order. And I think he was right. He was right that, you know, you don't have to be Jewish to create rebellious forms, but there is a, Jew, as Lenny Bruce said, you know, if, if you are uh, an African-American oppressed, uh, you're Jewish. If you are poor and living in the Bronx at Puerto Rican, you're Jewish. But if you are a Jew living in Iowa and happy, then you're not. <laughs> so, yes, so, uh, you know, it's a matter of social justice, it's a matter of social ideas, and it's a matter of, of a kind of struggle against falling asleep, against the world, uh, against oblivion. That, I think the Jewish, uh, if I might add to this, the Jewish idea uh, of, of uh, the great contribution that Jewish, uh, the Jews contributed is the idea of freedom, that, that you should never live enslaved. I think it's an idea that, uh, that we see today developing in Egypt, in Tunisia, we see people rebelling against oppression. And I think that's true. And of course, architecture also reflects order 
because it's a very important thing to have a city, to have buildings, to have streets. It's a reflection of order or of disorder. Are we going to the buildings now? So I, I think if we uh, stop <coughs> discussing four of your projects, uh, the, the first one would be the San Francisco Jewish Museum. Michael, do you want to start? Uh, uh, th there's a drawing you made uh, uh, of that. Which oh, is yes. The, this yes. drawing? I remember that one, yes. <laughs> can, the, <laughs> can the camera catch that? Uh, can you explain that drawing? It, 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 <laughs> uh, is this a dreidel? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of. Uh, you know, uh, this is in Hebrew. You know, I based a building on, uh, you know, I said, you know, what is Jewish, you know, what, what it, should a building be? Uh, it should be an experience that is special. Uh, and in this case, I based, based the building on, on the emblem of life, uh, the Chai, which in he, Lechaim, you know, it means to life. Right. And, and in Lechaim. Hebrew, the letters are not simply symbols, like in Latin or Greek. They are actually substantial uh, sort of members of the story. They are not immune from the story Numenai itself. In their own right. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I created a building that, that, for example, that form. It's it's within an old building. The building is not a freestanding building. Uh, it's it's oh yeah, there it is. Uh, that form on the left is the yud. It's the smallest letter Hebrew letter, which is a point. And I always, you know, I'm not a Talmudic scholar, but uh, think of it: Jerusalem, the Jew, Israel. Everything starts with the letter yud which is a point. And I thought, you know, let me try to make a building which is based also on a point. One part of the building, the Yud, uh, which is one of the letters, is based on this point. So again, there is a process of making accessible things that used to be found in only in literature or only in very difficult texts to access. And I wanted to make, it, wanted to make a building that shines with a different kind of light, different kind of space, which, which is functionally, of course, used for exhibitions, bar mitzvahs, weddings, uh, public events. And, and I think that's part of the, 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 the mystery of, of texts uh, and of, 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 of letters, because, you know, why not? Architecture is a big emblem as well, and it is also in some way a text. We can read buildings, of course, different from reading a book. Uh, we can decipher them, we can see the layers, we can see also whether they mean something important or whether they are just, uh, you know, the cover of the book without any substance inside. I, I, I very much like this project. And one of the things I like about it, it is uh, it's very restrained. Uh, it, it also is uh, uh, an exercise in compromise. And it's interesting to me that at ground zero, uh, compromise led to disaster. I mean, it, 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 I don't that think project so. was wrenched away I, uh, from well, the original I, I, uh, uh, concept. And in this project, uh, I think the, the, the fact that you designed it and then the budget was, was severely cut it has a certain restraint which makes the exuberance that spills out of the existing building uh, all the more remarkable. And I think it's a wonderful combination of uh, fitting in, responding, and it, the whole building feels like a conversation, a civic conversation at a very high level. And, and therefore, I think it's an extremely uh, beguiling building. Thank you. My question is, uh, you dealt with a building that was rebuilt in 1906 as a result of the Great Fire and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the city was kind of destroyed. Uh, to what extent did you play off that? I mean, to me it seemed that you had this conversation with the existing that was a, a long conversation. Uh, I will answer it. I will also correct you on ground zero because I don't agree with your interpretation mm -hmm. of it. Uh, it's very similar. There is a very strong uh, frame given. Uh, architecture is not something you practice in, just in, 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 in the sort of imaginative world. There are real constraints, political, architectural, social, economic. Uh, and every project has that strong frame. Uh, to do, I think, architecture, for me, to do interesting architecture is to engage with that frame. It's not to say I'm not doing a project because, for example, in this case, there was almost no free, quote, free space for the building. The building was given. It had to be within the footprint. It had to have the facade of City Beautiful, which is beautiful. I, I would never have touched it anyway. Uh, it was behind St. Patrick's Church. 
It was at the foot of the big hotel, not only at the foot, but part of the space of the museum is utilizing the underground of the museum. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a building struggling for an identity within almost a fixed context. You know, m perhaps another architect would have said, there's nothing more to do here. And there were a, s a few architects who were uh, before me on this building. There's nothing to do, just renovate the station and put a sign on the door that is a museum. But, but I think that's the, that's the beauty of architecture, to, to struggle and to create, as you say, that conversation with the possibilities, impossibilities, margins, uh, the, the, the fault lines, uh, the, the, the in-between spaces. And of course, I think that makes for, for, for an architecture that is interesting. No different, by the way, from Ground Zero. Ground Zero, you know, I, I, I also had to make compromises, and I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, you know, to, to, to engage yourself in a project which is really a civic project, where there's a lot of different political interests. There's a lot of different uh, 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 interests in terms of money on that project. I different uh, stakeholders, ranging from a you know, port authority to you know, the, the developers and their own architects, to the city of New York and the mayor, to the governors, not by now the fourth governor. No, so either you say, you know, I'm, I'm not doing this, I quit because I did some nice pictures and now they can go to a museum. Or you say, you know, you have to do your best, given what this context, it is dynamic, it's not static. Uh, and I think, uh, I think the public will see when Ground Zero is rebuilt that it was well worthwhile. And that, by the way, despite all the propaganda to the contrary, the, the master plan, I was just uh, you know, on the site a few weeks ago walking uh, with Chris, uh, for Ward, uh, and it's very close, unbelievably close to my original drawings. Uh, you know, take it or leave it, but you'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question that follows up on the, uh, maybe we can go to the, net, the interior slide of the, uh, there. Uh, uh, the idea that a, that a building actually has many levels is hinted at in the, uh, the, the, the statement that the wall, the partis wall, yes. has literal, allegorical, personal, and mystical potential meanings. If, if, if we were to actually consider the building a little differently than uh, a mere image, uh, even the architectural magazines today just show pictures. They don't really have the plans and stuff like that. Uh, wouldn't it be possible that, it, that, it, that we could study them to reveal these various mm -hmm. levels? And, and do you attempt that when you're designing? I mean, do you search for that ladder in the Kabbalah, or the set, or the interaction? I mean, how do you approach the multiple potential layers of meaning. Well, I think if an, idea is, if an idea is true, or if you struggle to, uh, with the truth of an idea, the way that Jacob struggled with the angel, and the, it's a struggle, but you discover things that you didn't know about before. Okay. You know, before I came to, to, this, uh, to this project, I didn't know that much about uh, that station, about what happened in San Francisco. So a building is also a magnifying glass that gi give you sort of a cut through the history. And if you're sensitive, and I think that's what a building is, a building is a carrier of memory. We underestimate, you're right, buildings are usually seen as objects, nicely photographed, you know, use them and so on, kind of like a car or a nice, you know, coffee maker or a washing machine uh, or a deodorant. But in truth, a building is m like a human being. A building is someone. It's not just something, it's someone, which means there is an intelligence in a building. There is a light, there is a soul, there is a flesh. Uh, and I think that's true for the buildings that I love. The buildings that I love, whatever their function was, whatever the time they were built, have this capacity to evoke more than just a utilitarian notion that you are a user and walking from A to B. They can, they can change the way you see the world. I think the buildings that I've been to changed my view of the world, whether it's you know, a building in ancient Greece, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's in Italy, whether it's here in New York City. A building is much more than we think about it today. And I think maybe with this notion of sustainability, people will rediscover that buildings are very precious, more than just as material objects. And we do live in a materialistic society. Almost everything is you know, done and you know, we open any news channel and it's all about money. It's about quantities. But there is more to life. We know it from our own selves, that we are more than just these material beings. There is a dream, there's a hope, there's something else happening. And I think that's what I, th I try to so unfolds instead of a building, because a building should have it. Uh, it's more, it's, it, it, a building is also mystical. 
Sure, because when you don't, when, when it suddenly appears in your dream. Why would a, a building appear in your dream and not just on a street? Uh, so there's a lot to be said. Uh, I'm not uh, you know, a writer, so I can't really articulate verbally. But all I can say is that a building, there's more to a building than meets the eye. How would you say the, materi the actual materiality of the building plays into that, that set of concerns, like the blue steel on, on this on this building on the outside. Well, I right? struggled to get that blue steel. It's very easy. The company almost went bankrupt because, you know, to produce this blue, there's a certain range. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a certain kind of process uh, of, uh, of producing this particular... And I wanted this blue because, to me, the, it was about this blue, this particular blue. I wondered about the blue. Why oh, the yeah. blue? For, well, the blue, uh, you know, everything comes out of the blue. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really, it's true. A blue is such a s such a deep color. Everybody, you know, you know. Apparently, young people don't like blue, but older people <laughs> gravitate to blue. Well, we have the blues, uh, in any case. But but I just th thought the blue was the appropriate color in symbolic ways, in, in practical ways, in the light of San Francisco, which which right. can have so many different characters of, of weather. Uh, so yes, you're right. Material does count. And because I've never been lucky to really use very expensive materials, now I have a, actually the first building in Germany, in Dusseldorf. It's an office, large complex, uh, very luxurious, where I can use marble. I always wanted to use stone, but I never was able because mm. it's just you know, not affordable for the most of the projects that I'm working on. So it is important. I, I do, think do we, we should probably go on to the another next, project, next project. And, and uh, that's the Denver Art Museum. And what's fascinating about the Denver Art Museum, it certainly isn't quiet, it isn't fitting into a context in the normal sense of the word, it has an amazing projectile quality to it. Uh, most buildings are contained, this is quite the opposite, it's, it's exuberant and it controls not just the space it's in, but it controls the space for several blocks in. And it's one of the buildings that, that one can point to that has um, the most direct effect on the largest area that I know of because these things are not static. They imply something well beyond itself. So uh, 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 on that's one side. The other side is, and that leads to my question, uh, there is always a debate when you have a theater or a stage how much attention should the stage get and how much attention should be devoted to what's on the stage. And in this case, you have this amazing structure and it almost renders any contents irrelevant or minor compared to the power of the building itself. How would you see that? Okay, let me collect you on the, on, on the ladder. Uh, this was not a building made for Rembrandt. Oh, I understand. It was made uh, primarily for Western art, for contemporary art, mm -hmm. for art uh, that is really new and radically new. Uh, and by the way, Denver, I love Denver. I love the American West. If I it wasn't from the Bronx, <laughs> I, I'd be living in, in, in the rock, you know, in, in this environment of the pioneers, because it seems to be a place where people are very open minded uh, and tough. And they are not followers. They don't follow what ha is happening in New York or in London or Paris. They are, they are you know, the, of the West. So, I th by the way, I could have never built this building without the city planners, uh, the curators, the directors of the museum, the board of trustees uh, being, so th and there was a competition. You know, Stephen Hall, uh, uh, you know, many uh, well-known archi architects uh, uh, participated. And it was a public process because it was partly, uh, you know, it was funded by the public taxpayers' money. Later on, of course, uh, uh, benefactors gave more money to the building, and it became the, the Fred Hamilton Building because he gave s so much more money. But uh, the truth is that a building, as you say, has more responsibility than just be a box. Uh, that's in my view. A building is not just a container to contain, to limit, and to. There are buildings that have a legitimate uh, uh, program to be containers. Uh, but this is not the, 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 the remit of this building. The remit of this building is to show the boldness of the art of the West, the boldness of the pioneering spirit of art today, globally. Uh, the fact that this building has recently been completely restructured in terms of its art. Artists, by the way, the oldest artist was, I think, 30 years old. Most of the artists were like <laughs> in their 20s yeah. and from all over the world. So 
the building, uh, my idea, and for the building, uh, and, and with the full support of, of their whole core of the city, was to create a building that mirrors the aspirations of Denver. And by the way, it has changed the neighborhood radically. There's a new museum being built now. Uh, the galleries are moving. The parking lots are disappearing. It's becoming a place to walk. It's next to the beautiful state capitol with a golden dome. So I think it has contributed to a reawakening of the fact that this part of town, which is downtown Denver, isn't sort of uh, the, the bad part of town. It's the great part of town. It's the historical part of town. And that uh, art isn't just within the box. It's, it's really an, a kind of a dynamic movement towards the city. And of course, all the forms, and I was lucky to build also the, the condominiums, the housing uh, uh, adjacent, and to be able to create a plaza w for art with great works of art by Klaus Oldenburg, Beverly Pepper, and so on. So it's a contribution to culture. And, and, a, and an art museum, look, what is an art museum? It's about the imagination, the muses. We too often think that a museum is like a bank. You know, <laughs> I mean, a museum modern art is close to a bank. But is that the model that of a museum? Is that what Picasso thought when he was painting? Uh, was he thinking of the auction prices? No, he was thinking of reawakening the potential of human imagination. And I think a, a museum which is not exuberant should not really be built. <laughs> <laughs> because why go to a museum which, uh, uh, which doesn't make your blood race and your adrenaline flow and, and make the works in the museum really what they are, dangerous, risky? Everything in this museum is risky, as is the building. You know, it's sort of going upwards in many directions at once. Nikolai Ozerov said it, th that there was, and I want to check and see if this is right, there was a fracturing of the street grids at that time that you took account of. Did, was that part of it? Uh, well, it wasn't referring so much. I mean, New York Times critics have their own Michigas. Right. But uh, all I can tell you is that the building really was responding to many civic buildings around, uh, which is not only the state capitol, but there's a great library by Michael Graves. There are the Giopanti buildings, to which I'm linked, right, right, famous right, yeah. uh, right. Italian architect, and creating a, a sort of social space where, where the building is really in the round. It's not about a back and a front and an elevation here and there, but creating a full environment a panoramic environment. And by the way, the new uh, Clifford Still Museum is going right to the west of the building. Uh, restaurants, uh, housing has, you know, the prices have come up there. So it's no longer this, this sort of lost part of town, but a very vibrant center of the city. So again, a building should do more, I think, than just be itself, by itself, be its own kind of icon. It should generate a new response of others to the city, because that's the way the city changes. And of course, Denver is a very good example. You know, the railroad, railroad was going to bypass Denver, but they were so smart that Denver, right? They rerouted the, the line, the straight line through Denver, and Denver became a center and continues to be a magnificent uh, American city. Could we go to the Dresden uh, work now? This to me is a very fascinating project <coughs> on so many levels. Uh, and, and since it's still under construction and hasn't yes. been... It's actually finished, and now they're doing the exhibition. It's almost finished as oh, a building, really? yes. Uh, maybe you could uh, uh, tell us the general strategy idea here. Uh, uh, the, well, this is a very large building, one of the largest museums in Germany, the uh, National Historical Military Museum of Germany. Uh, you know, we have to think of... Which survived the fire. Which survived, you know, many of those buildings uh, survived because they were not bombed because they were then centers of military allied military operations uh, in post-war Germany. But uh, uh, let me make it more clear. The armory is built in 1870. It's a great old armory. It, it functioned as an armory only for a, a couple of years. L became immediately the Saxon Museum. It's, you know, Saxony was very famous for all its militaristic might. Then it became uh, the German Museum, uh, then the, 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 um, you know, the, under Bismarck. Then it became the Nazi Museum. Uh, the, the fascist museum, uh, the Nazi museum, the Soviet museum, because the Russians occupied Dresden. Then it became the East German, East German museum, uh, you know, a military museum. And now, after the fall of the wall, it's a museum of a democratic state of Germany. My idea was different from all the competitors. All the competitors built in the back of the building, just in the back. They left the front immune as if nothing had happened. It was still, we were still in 1870. But you were supposed to do that too. Right? We were supposed to do it too, yes. I was supposed <laughs> to do that. But I thought, you know, no use to do that because why hide the military in a democracy? Why, why put the military under these oppressive uh, authoritarian walls of, of the 19th century? Why not project the public beyond the building towards the center of Dresden? And by the way, the building is pointing. Exactly, if you project the lines to the triangle, 
from which Dresden was bombed in that famous bombing of the Allies, which almost leveled the city completely. And I wanted to give people the priority to see the building interrupting, first of all, the chronology of that armor. It's a vast museum, and I'm also re you know, uh, in charge of redoing that building. But I preserved all the important elements, the, the, the core, that, that great staircase in the center. But the building is a, it's a moment of reflection. You, as you pass through the galleries, you're in a completely different space. You're not in the orthogonal space of the armory. You're not in that militarized space of exhibits. You're in a space that is truly evocative of many things that fall from the sky, that explode around you, uh, exploitation, violence of war, and you wind up at the top of the building, as you in a special light, looking at the so-called, well, at the, at the rebuilt Dresden, which is rebuilt, by the way, in a very nostalgic way. Every building looks like nothing has ever happened. But I hope that this museum will evoke and communicate to the public that there is something important to care about the military democracy, that the military should never be left alone as if it was its own sort of system, and to bring people to awareness of what is being built, rebuilt, what has been destroyed, what can never be recovered, and what are the hopes of the future. So the building's kind of sort of, I'm all, all, only to tell you that I'm very lucky that uh, the jury was a military jury. It, it, there was, it, because the, it belongs to the military. This is a museum in which the soldiers of Germany are brought to, to, to learn you know, the German history from the 13th century to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where NATO forces, of course, have German soldiers as well. So I think it's a very relevant uh, communicative museum. Interesting, I think, fascinating, because you're, you're traversing so many layers of history. And that history is also cut in a very particular way spatially. Hard to see it only from this rendering. Because as you move through the museum, the, the, the walls intersect and cut through the, the arched mm -hmm. uh, brickwork of the, of the armory. And there is a dialogue, as you say, between different histories that, uh, that devolve on, on the person. You have to begin to think, and uh, you know, what is, does this mean to me, all these weapons? And all, what does it mean to me? And of course, there's a different exhibition in, the, in this wedge-like form, which is more about reflection on violence. What, you know, I, I'm interested in, I, I, you can understand that uh, in 1945, 25,000 people died. It, the, the whole city, as you said, was just demolished. It wasn't this part of town, but you're looking Close towards to that. Close to but I think what, what, what uh, the, the course they were embarked on was sort of like the specimens they have in a museum. They're all in formaldehyde, they don't move, and they don't age very well. And, and so, having rebuilt the city exactly as it was, including the cathedral, yeah. uh, it, it, it had the sense of being a dead city. I mean, it really didn't, didn't breathe, it didn't give new life, it didn't go through rebirth. I'm curious how you were able to convince the city fathers that were so embarked on this recreation of the old to do something completely different and I'd like you to project out what's going to happen next. I mean, you broke through something that nobody had managed before to do something bold that isn't a recreation of mm -hmm. what people thought existed before. Uh, what do you think is going okay, to happen first next? Of all, first of all, let me say, because there are architects here, that I used very delicate methods. The building is cut only a few centimeters. There are two lines. Uh, just a few centimeters wide, which cut the facade and through which the wedge projects, and then you have the observatory and, of course, the uh, kind of exhibit three-dimensional vitrine. So despite the fact that it looks very radical, I have hardly touched the historical building. And I think, uh, I think this is important because, you know, if you destroy a very important historical building, you would never get permission. Nobody would ever allow you to build it. But you can, with a very minimal means, create a maximal effect. A maximal transformation of the historical idea of where you are, what it is, what are you looking at. And I think uh, what you're suggesting is, is really the key. You have to be able to convince others that what you're doing is really the right way to reawaken the fact that Dresden is not just a city of the past. It's also a city of the future. It's a city of high tech, very, very interesting city, has had an illustrious uh, history. It, it's but it has taken, a, you know, and I understand the sentimentality. After such a vast destruction, I understand that people need, they want to, to bring back everything as if nothing had happened. But at the same time, I think people also understand that it's not enough. And I think this building, perhaps maybe is the first building in Dresden that the public will see and also experience as dealing with history in a sensitive way, but also going beyond that history 
by pointing to things that need to be pointed to, which is there is a future horizon to the city. It's, you know, if it's going to compete with Berlin, with Frankfurt, with you know, London, whatever, it has to be a city that is forward-looking and moves ahead. And I think uh, that's the only reason this building is being built. Because uh, again, so, so you conjecture <coughs> that in the future they're going to uh, you have actually broken through that constraint. You you assume that from now on those constraints won't play as large a role in I, the future I of the city. I, I, I can't say that, but I can only say that I think the public, and you know, much should never underestimate the public. Too often, you know, architecture critics <coughs> under you know tell the public what to think and what to do. I remember when I built the Jewish Museum. All the critics of Germany and, and the world were against the building. They said the building is incomprehensible. It, nobody will ever use it. it, it nobody will ever go in there. It, it's, it's crazy, you know, literally. Uh, but you, know, you shouldn't really design for the critics. You should design for the public. And the public is very imaginative. The public is very intellectual, even if they had never had more than you know, third grade education, because people know what buildings are. They know what buildings can do. And I think uh, that's part of the strategy here that the public does want to expose. You know, uh, Germany has been a relatively pacifist country after the war, but it has a strong military. It has to play a role in Europe, uh, in the European community. It is building will evoke, I'm sure, a lot of debates in Germany about the military's role in society. And so it's not a building that is bashful. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a controversy, a dialogue that I think is important, and the building can you know, help people because it literally provides spaces to do that. And you know, those vitrines, those vertical diagonal things that cut through the building uh, have some fantastic uh, uh, encounter with emblematic <coughs> objects like the Dora you know, rocket of Werner von Braun that was you know, uh, 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 constructed by slave labor who mostly perished uh, in there. So these are not just technical objects of advancement of the military. They are objects in which human suffering is also evident. And I wanted to, to, at that moment, at the kind of anthropological moment of the wedge, to have a reflection on violence, reflection on the wars. It's not a commentary because people will make their own, uh, will take their own ideas from this. But I think architecture has to provide the space or the stage for that to happen. I think it's a very subtle way of being both uh, critical and optimistic in the sense that this building was a beautiful mask of all the violence, yeah. and, and which has now been revealed to be a mask uh, with an optimistic new form. One specific decision for our students. It, you, you can see the rectilinearity of the rooms in the old building, and you can see the different angle of your wedge, right. but then your interior subdivision inside is not on either angle. Mm -hmm. It's correct. Very, very <laughs> sharp oh. eye. Well, the, the, you know, it, it's like a, it, it's a dynamic pointer, even though it's static. But it does reconcile, it, it, it's in between many different aspects of experience, moving from w one wing of the museum to the other, traversing this. And of course, the stair is also one of the main means of circulation in the building, the central stair. Uh, you notice that, uh, perhaps you didn't, but I also restored the facade of the building, which was completely devastated by the East German government. They, they took away the, the character of that, of that armory. So I have rebuilt uh, the corners, all that neoclassic kind of incredible architecture, very particular uh, uh, of that Saxon style. Uh, and, and the building is a kind of a, in a tense relationship with a completely rebuilt front of the building, which is now very evidently the center of the building. And the activities which are shifted uh, let's say, in a, in, in, a, in a kind of form of anxiety, because by shifting it, there, on the right-hand side, you see in, in the ground floor and elsewhere, the cafes, the restaurants, the bookstore, and so on. So there's also a functional need to really bring people to the armory with a totally different expectation, mm -hmm. instead of just the fans of military hardware. And too many military museums are just obsessed with people who just like military history, whether they're soldiers or others. But I think it's interesting for everyone to participate in that story, because what is the story being told by a military museum? It's a story of, the th you know, of, of centuries of suffering, of centuries of aggression, centuries of devastating human minds. And the fact that this building is disciplined, but in a totally different way, in terms of its urban strategy, architectural strategy, experience for the visitor, I think will make an interesting dialogue and, a, and, a, and also a question about history, which is a burning question. As we see, we don't really control history. History is something that happens, uh, happens to us. 
At this point, I think we should go to a different scale. And uh, the last project we have oh, time yes. to discuss oh, is the Fiera Milano. Uh, and it's built on an old fairground. And, and in that case, you are part of a consortium with uh, Isazaki, uh, Zahadid, and uh, Pierpaolo Maggiora. And in that case, you were the master planner. You also planned a bunch of the buildings. And I wonder what your attitude is towards creating the context and then interpreting the context that you have created. Good question. Uh, one of the, re uh, of the uh, strategy of the master plan is to create a heterogeneous master plan so that different architects could express their own ideas of architecture and of the city. So it's not a rigid, master, uh, a rigid grid of some sort where everybody just plugs in a building, but kind of areas or neighborhoods. Uh, and it's surely Zaha's project is very different from mine, very different from Isozaki's. That was the idea of the master plan. Uh, I also want to say that uh, I find, uh, and, and I'm doing several things, the, the, the central tower uh, is part of uh, my remit, housing, uh, area of housing, and also the Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, but uh, one of the most challenging aspects is to create housing. You know, it, because housing seems to be kind of a typology that is not as glorious as building museums or cathedrals. But I find that uh, creating high level, high density housing in an urban environment is something that requires amazing uh, research, amazing uh, commitment, because it's very difficult to design housing inventively, because, you know, if people want, you know, certain kinds of rooms, certain relationships, you can't change those easily. But how do you create something that that meets the expectations of the marketplace, but at the same time is an architectural advance uh, and, and gives something uh, to the people of Milan which they cannot have. For example, larger floor plates instead of the 19th century, 18th century building fabric, which is very limited. Larger spaces with more light, uh, with more amenities, a park. That was the center of, of, of this scheme. I created a park, a plaza, which is really a park rather than a hardscape plaza with the metro station and so on. Uh, 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 and public transport at the center of it. So uh, it, it's a very complex project and, and of course uh, it, it, it was a competition. Every architect in the world was part of it. I, I, I think every you know, acquaintance, friend and, and, and ad admired architect was in this competition. We were lucky to, uh, to win this and of course the challenge is not to win the competition, is to build something worthwhile because of course there are a lot of pressures, economic, political, social, how to develop the site. Uh, I can tell you that the site is under construction our uh, 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 buildings, we have eight uh, residential towers, and then of course the central tower and another tower in addition to the previous tower, uh, and the museum which is also on the, on the, on the way. So it, it's, it's been a fantastic adventure and working in Milan, which is a very sophisticated city, a city of design, of art, of fashion, uh, where everybody has a very, very sophisticated un understanding of what is good architecture because they've got, you know, they've got Brunelleschi, they've got the, the Duomo, they've got great examples across time. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true challenge to create buildings that people want to live in, want to be in, and at the same time buildings that also slightly create a new idea of, of, of the center of the city, uh, which I think is important for any European city that is competing with other cities. I, I thought I noticed a, a very subtle shift in formal language. If, if the museums could be characterized by the, the, the urge to push people to make them more imaginative, to have them occupy a new space, uh, a new mental space, uh, a new urban place. These seem to have become so, were softer, where before there were slashing, now they're sinuous. There's, well, it, you uh, know, I mean, people you, are, I mean, they you, lived there for years. I mean, well, so. I, I have to say, this museum is, is a homage to my favorite artist, one of my favorite artists, Leonardo, who is from Milan, Leonardo da Vinci. And the museum, I thought about this emblem of, of, of the man the uh, in, the, in the circle in the square, uh, you know, that, that figure. I thought, you know, if Leonardo was living today, would, he, would it still be a man or would it be man, woman, you know, would it be open, gender, non-gender specific? Would it be extruded straight up, that, that relationship, you know, flattened space of the circle, or would it, would it drift obliquely towards unknown horizons? So I created a museum which is really, you know, at the top you have a perfect circle, at the bottom you have a perfect square. It's very Milanese, it's, it's a very Milan vocabulary, the circle and the square. Yes. I've seldom used it in this particular way. Uh, but I think it's a museum which is quite, uh, quite radical because every floor has a different plan. 
So you start with, with a square plan, you wind up with a circular plan. It's not a ramp of museum, it's a, it's a core. And I thought this is an interesting analysis also of the, what Leonardo was trying to say to Milan today. W you know, what are the, those trans transitive moments from, of space between the perfect forms of the square and a circle? And in between you have, the, let's say, the irrational forms, which have never found room in the Renaissance vocabulary. So again, I think it's a, a, you know, a culturally specific museum. It's not a museum of contemporary art for Berlin. It's not a museum of contemporary ar art for, you know, of, of LA. It's Milan. And uh, you, in every place, you have to work with a unique cultural setting. You can't just impose something. You have to work from within the vocabulary of the place. Denver is sharp-edged. It's yeah. the mile-high city. It's glittering, and it's sharp, and uncompromising. Right. Uh, so that building has its own uh, local character, too. I, I was interested to see uh, your uh, approach in a city like Milano. Uh, when Pavarotti, the great singer, was asked uh, how it felt to sing at La Scala, the great opera house in Milano, he said that's the only opera house in the world that he feared. And the reason he feared it is because everybody knew how it should be. And they knew the libretto, they knew what the music should sound like, and so he had a really knowledgeable audience. Uh, when it comes to visual things, it is a very cultured city with a great deal of knowledge of how things should be. And I see in your housing that you really departed very radically from how it should be because you have created not the normal apartments. They have wonderful apartments, they're palazzi, but they also have apartments that are in a grid, locked mm -hmm. in a grid. Correct. Yours are huge houses in the sky. They're enormous. And each one is different to the other. So if you're in one place, I'm your neighbor, I could go to your place and it would be a completely different right. experience. To what extent do you think the acceptance of this scheme that it actually got to be built had to do with departing from the framework that enabled them to be critical? Well, I think, I think uh, every client, in my experience, wants something really ambitious. There's n I've never worked for clients who said, build the same thing that I see over here. <laughs> they, they, uh, clients are, um, and because it's a, it's a competitive market. There are three other projects uh, going on in Milan. One of them, uh, Foster, collapsed. It was a very beautiful scheme, but it just didn't happen. So you have to be lucky, and you have to create something also that kind of ha is practical. It's not just about ideas, something that, that offers something in a practical way, which is desirable. Uh, and uh, that's what I said, you have to really understand the marketplace. But at the same time, you have to create desires that are not existing within, uh, you know, within the known you know, uh, statistics, which is, for example, the way the buildings look. And of course, uh, everything in architecture is somehow a risk. I if you're going to do anything, you, you, you push the boundary, but you have to be sensitive to the fact that it might, you know, there, there are going to be responses. People might say, you know, this is this or this is that. Uh, not only in a positive sense. So you have to hit a kind of a balance. And I think uh, this uh, project has hit a good balance because it's, I think, attractive to the Milanese. And Milanese, I lived in Milan many years ago. My daughter was born there. And I know they live in a very high, they have a very high standard. It's the only city in the world where people walk around, uh, you know, shop windows, stop for 20 minutes and look at a pair of shoes. I've never, I, you know, I've never, no, I've never understood anywhere else. But no wonder Prada, Missoni, all these companies come from Milan because people are sensitized to completely small details. And by the way, I built a, a model house, which is now the, you know, where they're selling the apartment. And people come in and they look at, you know, at, 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 at a wall buildup, yeah. at a wall buildup, and they say, is this the best wall buildup we can have in Milan? So you have to be very, very canny in terms of the technical performance of a building. Uh, it's energy consumption and, and it's innovation. And of course, much of the innovation is in the technology. How, how clever technically the building is in terms of saving money, saving energy, saving uh, costs, and so on. Uh, and that's part of creating something that I think uh, will have a future.